I'll, I'll get started with the uh, presentation. I was going to take some of the images that you have in your package and put them up on the screen just so that everyone can get a chance to look at those. Because it's after 7 o'clock on a Monday night and nobody wouldn't want to talk about vendor cards or street vending in any way, shape, or form. It's a perfect time. Um, so I have a uh, request for direction. We've gone over this topic before in the past. Uh, what you see in front of you is a reflection of some of the conversations that we've had. Uh, mention of comparable municipalities in Alberta that we've looked at. In addition, I've included the uh, reference to the city of Penticton for their food, mobile food vending policies. Uh, I've also uh, chatted with uh, people from the town of Olds regarding their mobile vending bylaw and uh, referred to other guidelines that you see in the attachment from uh, the city of Canmore, as well as the town of Cochrane. Uh, now is a good time to be going through mobile vending and, and pointing us in the right direction so that we can put the changes in place for the upcoming season. Um, the uh, Just a little bit of background, and I think you're all more or less aware that uh, it's, a con it's been a convoluted process in the past, and, uh, and then a very unique use of a uh, laptop by uh, Councillor Zariski. So I want to congratulate him for that. Um, all right, so the, the process for vending in, in our past has kind of gone as follows. We've gone through a, a selection of different areas, the areas that we have uh, provided access for mobile vending are those that I've provided in your package, uh, Rotary Park. You can see my sharpied sections of the drawing that identify uh, where vending could take place uh, or has taken place in the past in the case of uh, Rotary Park. You'll see a couple of street view shots of the location as well, just to give you some perspective. And then you'll also see uh, an aerial view of the par public market space, which is uh, and has been downtown uh, previously along Center Street, just south of Third Avenue West. And then you'll see some street views there to, uh, to give you a better idea exactly of where we're talking. You'll also see uh, areas that were discussed at our last uh, meeting in reference to downtown revitalization and potential for an area on the north part of Third Avenue and Center Street that could be a, a good location for placement of storage containers uh, as vending units. As well, I've identified possible locations at Newcastle Beach that could be considered if Council so wishes to include that location as an alternative or in addition to uh, the Hoodoos and Suspension Bridge uh, locations that have also been uh, used in the past. Uh, you will not see on the uh, photo on page 17 of your package, you'll see more or less where uh, vending has occurred at the Hoodoo site on the aerial photo there. Uh, so there is a storage container where you do see the uh, cross-hatched uh, boxes in the lower southwest corner of the property there. Um, Community Futures had communicated to us earlier today that they had... Uh, uh, intended on having two vendors at that location within that storage container, which has power uh, and has been installed and that they believe that they can fill uh, two spots on that location, the cross hatched area, two applicants, one spot. Okay. So it's just one, it's just one spot. Okay. I guess it's the number of windows on the, on the container that tells the story. Uh, on the east part of the property, just where the entrance to the parking lot is, is normally where we would see other vendors. So we've had uh, ice cream trucks and other vendors of that type uh, located there in the past. 
As we move into page 19, you'll see the areas at the suspension bridge where we've had vendors as well. And then uh, a, a street view shot of that same location on page 20 uh, for the suspension bridge and then uh, identification of an area at Riverview Park where a, a site could be placed as well. Again, at uh, council's discretion, if you choose, I should say after showing all those locations as well, uh, one of the options the council has is to not designate areas and to just say that er certain areas are wide open and it's subject just to a review. One of the recommendations that we had previously was to uh, adopt an approach that was more more, more like the one that is used by the town of Olds and to enact uh, a mobile vending bylaw, which would then uh, refer applications to the Municipal Planning Commission so that they could take uh, the uh, applications and assess them on the merit. There's some discussion in the package as well about the fees that are charged for uh, mobile vending in some of the comparable communities that I've identified. And I uh, just want to give you a, a bit of an idea of the range that's out there. Uh, in Olds, it's a $25 per year resident fee, a $50 per year non-resident fee. This is not necessarily in your write-up. Uh, they do have penalties for non-compliance, ranging from two to $800. Penticton's yearly uh, rental for a mobile vending unit is $1,880 per year. The City of Calgary, their cost is a cost per day ranging from $17 to $25 per day, depending on, uh, and that's just a weekday rate, it's $50 per day on a weekend. And in addition to that, they charge per lineal meter of unit size. So they, uh, more or less, if you rounded it, you'd be looking at on, a, on say, a weekend in Calgary, uh, daily rate, probably in the neighborhood of uh, I'm going to say roughly about $65 per day uh, if you're using the City of Calgary numbers. I'm not suggesting at any time that we follow the City of Calgary in particular, and I believe uh, Penticton's numbers are too high. Yet at the same time, we want to be able to uh, balance the difference in the costs associated with operating a bricks and mortar facility type business in Drumheller with one that is mobile and can be located wherever high traffic exists. So there are some advantages there as well. Um, additionally, I don't necessarily speak to it uh, specifically, but the concept of having a uh, con storage container village or a uh, collection of storage containers in the downtown area may uh, require a little bit more work to define what costs should be uh, associated. As well, a few, a few dangling pieces of the puzzle include uh, how we deal with the issue of electricity or electrification of units, and if we permit or allow the use of electrical generators in, in, uh, in conjunction with mobile vending units. These are all things that we've dealt with in the past. And they're all things that we expect we would deal with in the future, and that's why they're on the uh, on the package and, and, and discussed in the request for direction here this evening. Um, there was a definite note to look at other communities. So I've, as I mentioned earlier, included uh, Penticton's application process. Uh, there's many elements of the process itself that are common or what we would already use. Uh, for example, we would require that a, uh, a site at this point is set by council unless it's on private property, uh, that there are uh, or should be considerations of the distances from the operation of a vending unit in relation to other businesses that it may be located near. Uh, as well, common themes for liability insurance to, to protect the town in the event of any kind of an accident or injury and make sure that the town uh, is covered in any incident that could occur. As well, uh, health authority approval is, is standard in all of this. Of course, the exceptions that uh, we note uh, as well are those that are connected with public markets and festivals. 
uh, where the market organizers in Drumheller are the ones that set the rates and we actually register the market organizers as those who are responsible for the management of vending on a larger scale. And the reason we do that is so that we make it easier on ourselves to A, not have to put as close of a monitoring on the activity. So we put the burden on the market organizers to follow and, and make sure that their uh, vendors are complying with what they consider to be good business practices. And then I've got a little bit of a reference there to very similar things from the, uh, the town of Canmore. Uh, in terms of different location requests that are made in their municipality. So they clearly mark uh, several uh, locations uh, where uh, you, you cannot be uh, vending, uh, but then they also do say you can be allowed to vend in, uh, in other areas. Just as an example in Canmore, they say you can't smoke within five meters of the vending unit. That would be... Uh, very consistent with Alberta Tobacco Act legislation. Uh, generators are not permitted if they create a disturbance. There's no hard and fast rule on how many uh, decibels of a generator might produce, just that if there is cause for disturbance that that would then be investigated. Uh, there's a, a note there, and I'm not sure if I believe this is, is good or bad, to, they don't allow the use of tables and chairs uh, or mats outside the unit, no overnight parking of mobile units at the vending location. Drum Heller, we've seen consistent overnight parking of vending units uh, over the years. Uh, although in our early uh, application of some of the policy that we tried to put in place, it did call for those to be removed. Um, however, I will say that policies that we currently have in place were suited for push carts rather than trailers or vending trucks or anything a lot larger than that. So in terms of security, uh, again, with liability insurance in, in place, we wouldn't necessarily consider that an issue. Um, nor do I think that we would have a problem with a canopy or a tent or awning that could be associated with a vending unit, provided it doesn't interfere with uh, park space that's already existing. Um, and just common sense, uh, vendors uh, should uh, not be harassing anyone while they're out there in the course of their business. That is the wide range of topics that I believe I have covered here. Um, uh, the issue of working with Community Futures Big Country, I believe, needs to be addressed as well uh, as the pilot project as this is in place. I would suggest that we would move forward with them in the form of a formalized letter of agreement or a memorandum of understanding so the terms and conditions are met for how we move forward with them. Um, of course, the value of the actual licenses themselves need to be uh, confirmed. As well, uh, determination if you want to move to the development authorities making the, making the decisions and uh, some reference to a lottery or draw process if there are requests for certain high traffic areas that uh, get more action than others, I guess you could say. Uh, we do and have had uh, in the past people who want to be in the same place and they may submit a preference for say site one, two, or three. Um, everybody wants site number one, but you might be able to give them site two or three depending on uh, their openness uh, and willingness to play uh, in an alternative location. I think that uh, pretty much caps it for me at this point, so I'd be open for your questions. Jay. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Just to clarify, this is a committee meeting, right? Not a council meeting? I'm not limited to five minutes because I don't think I can do it. Um, lots of thoughts. Uh, and they'll probably be rambly, um, but uh, I'll try to phrase many of them in terms of uh, the direction that you're looking for, at least from my opinion. Um, I'll start by saying, you know, if I'm getting this correctly, someone trying to enter into this business could be asked to pay for a development permit 
a business license, and then potentially uh, whatever the mobile vending permit fee is as well. And I totally understand the need to formalize what we're doing. And at the same time, uh, the need to reduce the hurdles and streamline the processes. Uh, I, I, I wonder about, you know, whether we're maintaining that balance because the, the, the part that can never be stated strongly enough, in my opinion, as for how we do everything as it relates to new business in Drumheller uh, or seasonal business or however we want to refer to it, I mean, I guess to all businesses, the businesses don't start with a giant pot of money to spend. If they had a giant pot of money to spend, they might choose just to keep that giant pot of money and not go into business. Uh, and so the number of expenses required before one gets to sell one widget uh, to start to recoup those costs, uh, keeping those as low as possible while still maintaining that balance. I, I totally understand the, the issue of fair play and how do we uh, adequately balance what someone who has a bricks and mortar operation contributes to this community um, and, and how much does someone who is having a mobile vendor cart contribute to this community. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I've got an answer there, but what I can tell you is that the $750 fee that's proposed in the document strikes me as too high uh, and discouraging. Um, that it might discourage the amount of new business that may wish to uh, because a number of those things may be so seasonal that 750 could be the difference between whether they make any money that year or not. It's enough money for a, a, a new business that small. Um, so I, I'm concerned about that. As far as the issues go, um, I don't know. I don't have strong feelings about number one in terms of the, the number of locations. Uh, I, I don't have any issues with any of the public lots that you've referred to. They all seem appropriate and encouraging people to think divergently about where else they could go, I think is a great idea. I mean, Riverside Park is a perfect example of, of a park that is very busy all summer long, but I don't know anyone's ever thought about placing a location there. Um, as far as operations go in number two, uh, Previously, a lot had been made around, you know, someone being given a spot and then choosing not to operate and those sorts of things. I don't, I don't hold those same concerns. I'd much rather that, that whatever operational expectations we would establish would be more like you need to operate within a certain number of hours. So you may not open before 8 a.m. and you may not be open past 9 p.m. or something rather than thou must be open during those hours. It's I see it more as a as a. The, it, it's more of a within rather than than uh, telling someone they've got a, their store's got to be open all the time. These are typically operated by single operators using seasonal staff who may or may not be rely. I mean, I just I don't want to see us discourage this by telling someone they've got to be open seven days a week from eight till nine when that may not be appropriate for what they're selling. Um, so whatever I think that that needs to be reviewed. As far as the fees go, I've mentioned that already. I, I think that might be too high. Uh, at 750. As far as expense goes, under number four, I absolutely agree that when when there's a potential for utility to be involved, where the bill needs to be paid, that the recouping of those expenses is absolutely appropriate. At the same time, the installation of those uh, of those utilities may be beyond. And if we're trying to stimulate again, it may be one of those investments that the town of Drumheller makes uh, uh, and only sees those that return on investment paid back through the operation of that business and whatever we do collect. But uh, but if if someone's uh, if we're putting in the installation, I, I'm not sure it's reasonable. Aside from our partner with Community Futures, I'm not sure it's reasonable to expect a single vendor to to outlay ten thousand dollars in utility installation costs. Um, but whether or not we could enter into a contract of kinds. I, I don't know what's appropriate there, guys. But in terms of if somebody thinks it exists already and they want to plug in, then absolutely they should pay for that. Um, as far as generators go, I'm hoping that the community standards bylaw is sufficient here. Uh, Greg, any thoughts? Right. But we have a bylaw that exists that says what's an, what's an appropriate amount of decibels. Oh, okay. Be an inverter generators would almost across the border be too intrusive. 
What's typically being used right now by the people who operated last year? People that worked at the park last summer had inverters. Okay. So the bylaw needs to state that more specifically then? Well, no, the bylaw states decibel levels and different, okay. different hours and different, and um, due to a complaint, they were professionally tested and found to be within right. acceptable limits under the bylaw. So perhaps we, but as a result though, that in terms of being prescriptive to people and what, what the bylaw would encourage would be the use of the word inverter rather than the use, use of the word generator, if that simply probably wouldn't work, right? Um, as far as number five goes, uh, oh, we dealt with that one already. Uh, number six, absolutely. Uh, I don't know why we wouldn't uh, formalize that agreement for expectations to the letter. Um, and I have no issues with the development authority and MPC being the body that deliberates. Uh, I, the, I'm hopeful that when this uh, bylaw comes to council, it will be the last time we talk about this issue for a long time to come because um, we do seem to be spending a lot of time on it. Uh, other than that, fellas, you know, I really, I don't know how to answer the mystery around fair pay. I, I, I'm, I, I totally understand the other major centers uh, understanding uh, or, or in putting in a, uh, a policy which truly, uh, uh, obviously, must be a drop in the bucket to what their mobile vendors are making or else they simply wouldn't have them. And, uh, and, but at the same time, when we're talking about trying to encourage a fledgling industry, um, maybe we need to evolve over a number of years if we see that actually opening up, making the expectations clear, keeping the fees as low as possible, uh, and, and broadening the number of opportunities that are out there um, makes the industry grow. Um, and once it's more established, it would make sense to me that, that we might want to review the idea of, of how much are they contributing back to this community as far as are they paying an appropriate fee. But as it stands right now, given that, uh, that we've had just a couple operators in this new you know, food truck, et cetera, sort of world, um, uh, I'm reluctant to put in so many, yeah, so many roadblocks that they would discourage further expansion here. Um, so, that's all I got to say about that for now. Tom? Just a couple of points. Um, so we have uh, the suggested designated areas. This is on town property, correct? Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that there might not be other areas uh, that we haven't thought of that vendors, and just off the top of my head, I'm thinking Wayne. Uh, you know, Wayne is very busy all summer, uh, and that might be an opportunity as well. So, so I'm just wondering whether we should leave it at designated areas or let the vendors choose. You know, like if somebody wants to go to the Hoodoos, fine. If somebody wants to think of another area um, that they might find or think more lucrative, then, you know, w would we stop that or... or so we're, we're not necessarily limiting ourselves to these areas that we've designated here. Just, just direction. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if, if uh, okay. you know, I mean, you can say these are areas that have been designated, but you could actually say, or at the discretion of MPC, if okay. you wanted yeah. to go that way. That's what I wanted. Uh, and I'm also thinking of the, the lottery draw kind of an idea and I'm not sure I, I can see how that will work. Uh, I mean, if, if somebody has an idea and they want to uh, put up a, whatever, some kind of a food um, sea can, and, you know, they, they want to put it up at the dinosaur because that's where everybody is, and you say, well, no, you didn't win that spot. you got to go to the uh, swinging bridge. I'm, I'm not sure that they would do that. Uh, you know, I don't think I would. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure how that, that lottery draw would work, but, you know, maybe it would, but maybe it wouldn't. Uh, and the other thing I'm looking at is also private property. Uh, is this bylaw going to uh, have the same ramifications for people who want to put a, you know, a food truck on private property, or it'll be the same kind of qualifications and permit process and, yeah. Um. As far as uh, private property goes, this would actually mean that 
those locating on public lands would follow closer to the process that we already have in place for public lands. So there is a, uh, a letter of permission that's submitted with a development permit application and it goes to the Municipal Planning Commission. And this is one reason why we want to take this and put it into the same process. So it's more consistent so people don't go, oh, for you, I have to go through this process. But if you're on private land, you just go over here and we can just process your permit. Um, just maybe getting back to a couple points that Jay made there. Um, there are some options to reduce cost. Uh, one of them is the uh, ability to pay a one month uh, business license, as well as the micro business licenses, which are substantially less than, than a regular business license fee. Uh, so that does make it possible for entry in to be more affordable for people who want to try this out uh, on a first time basis. And uh, you're right, most people that do come forward with applications, uh, they have capital costs that they need to cover in order to set up, and they have inventory that they need to acquire in order to get in business. So uh, definitely we don't want to uh, uh, you know, overlook that fact. Uh, at the same token, we just wanted council's direction on uh, what, are, what an appropriate fee would be uh, in consideration of some of the blowback that we might have received in the past from bricks and mortar operators that kind of say, hey, this guy can go on the street where there's 200,000 people a year and then they just pack up at the end of the year and go to the Bahamas or whatever. It's, uh, you know, there's the, those kind of comments that, uh, that people make. Lisa? In regards to, say, the farmer's markets or the markets, would they be required to pay the same fee as an individual vendor? Um, what we do with the public markets is we uh, register them as a, uh, a business. Uh, they have hold that license for a public market. And then uh, it's up to them to set whatever rate they would pay or charge, I should say for participation in their market. So if I wanted to participate in a uh, market on Center Street, in my normal location, let's say it was at Newcastle Beach, but I knew that there was a public market on Saturday and I wanted to participate in that, then you would simply pay the market organizer whatever their fee is for, for a location in that market. Uh, okay. Public market uh, operators pay one fee per year and uh, we don't charge them every time they set up their market. Uh, part of the reason for that was to uh, try and get them to have a place to incubate business, start out in a market, and maybe if you're successful and you've got a following, then you move into something more like a, a, a street, or pardon me, a, a mobile vending unit or whatever. Um, one of the items I missed when I was going through it is uh, and you probably did read that, though, was to try and consolidate the public markets in one location. I just wanted so, clarity. Yeah, try and consolidate those. There might be a, a you know, a, a painted line that you have to go from market A to market B. But, <laughs> but the point being that if you can consolidate all of the activity in one general area, they'll probably get more overall foot traffic as a result. And then you get a higher concentration downtown in that area that's been established over time. Okay, and then the other um, thought I had is in regards to those development permits, if they have to move to an alternate location for whatever reason, um, maybe it's not busy enough at the location that they're at and they opt to choose elsewhere. Um, I heard one individual had a such case this summer and um, he was pretty upset because he had to pay another development permit to still operate his business within the town from Heller. So I'd like for us to be able to facilitate a way that we aren't making it too onerous, as Jay kind of alluded to earlier in regards to the cost for these smaller businesses. Um, and then Tom had said about designated areas, perhaps not having them. I think, to be honest, that it's better to have the clarity about designated areas, but maybe more freedom as to where they can go might be a better answer. Um, that way they're not worrying about going on public land or private land or private property and not confusing the process. Um, I don't mind the first, the draws first come first serve idea either or works for me. Um, 
Let's see the one to make sure that we adequately allow generators. Absolutely. Um, I saw, and I think it was Canmore's bylaw, they had, they excluded A-frame signs. I'm hoping we don't have something like that because A-frames are just to be informative for customers. Um, and mobility. So you'd mentioned yourself, Paul, in regards to trailers being left overnight. Um, after listening to some of those vendors, I, I think it would be um, prudent upon us to facilitate that process. Um, especially in some of those higher traffic areas, pulling out trailers every night might be a little onerous. Um, I guess just the main thing is to make sure that there's proper um, teeth in there so they're not destroying the ground or the grass that they're leaving those trailers on. So, just my few cents. Christine? Okay, I got a few things here. So I totally agree with Lisa and Jay. Um, if if we had something in place that was just, just let them just let them do it. I feel like if it was a first come first serve thing on like not necessarily a lottery, you know that gives them the initiative, get up, get going, get this happening. I don't know personally. I would like to see it that they could go until eight o'clock, ten o'clock at night, because there's still people. It's still light out. Like there's still stuff going on. And so, if the business owner wants to do that and is willing to put in the hours like that and work, I don't think we should say no. You can't. Um, with the generators, I did a little bit of research on the uh, decibel points and stuff like that. You can get them that range from 49 to 60, and they say that that's equivalent to like speech like we're having right here. So I think that if we follow a regular idling vehicle, that's probably just fine. So I, I don't even know where that's at. I know a vacuum cleaner runs at 70, so these generators are running a little less than that. Um, the other thing, um, when I was going through the old bylaw 3.11, they talk about 100 meters of a commercial retail store. I think that's a little excessive myself. I, I'm i not against a little bit of healthy competition and stuff like that. I think it's good for our economy. I think it brings the price down of goods and services. And it just, it's it's a good thing. And so... You know, who, who was it that we saw in here was 50. Someone was 50 meters. So that's that's a little bit more reasonable so that we don't have people just absolutely mad at every vendor everywhere. Is that Canmore? Yeah, Canmore. And so, and then of course, when it comes to people being on private property, just make that as simple as possible, right? So if we've got a business owner that says, yeah, I've worked a deal with this person, they can park on my grass. Like we... I don't feel like we need to be jumping down people's throats for that one too much. So now that's pretty much what I got. <laughs> Fred? Paul, well, I, I, I like the direction it's going to. I, I follow with, with the rest of them about the about the cost. I think we need to keep it down and encourage more people um, to move ahead with small business. I do think that mobile vending is mobile vending and that to get somebody to make a sixty or seventy thousand dollar investment in a truck or a trailer and then saying you have to stay here regardless um, or you pay more, you know, is just I don't know it's hamstring and I think it, we need to come up with something that allows them that the ability to move where the crowds are moving or or f find locations that are good. And I said before, Free Enterprise says if you got to get up at four o'clock in the morning to get a good spot, you get up. It's like hunting and anything else. And uh, survival of the fittest. I think that um, uh, there's a, a place for 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 the the fixed locations, but the, but the mobile vending should be looked at as a, as something unique and be able to move around our community and add to the the football games at the high school or the bike rally at Wayne or the music festival in, in East Cooley. They should go where, where uh, the dollar takes them to make their business successful. Jay? Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> uh, just to clarify, uh, because the a couple of my colleagues who said they agree with something I actually don't want at all. Um, I am uh, just to swim against the stream here. I am totally against a first come first serve free for all. 
Um, and and I, the, the thing I would compare it to would be, we've been asked a number of times over the years by the taxi commission to install taxi stand, uh, a taxi stand at a couple of the more popular night spots in the community. Um, and if we had done that, it would have guaranteed multiple confrontations on a daily basis, I would imagine, as someone stayed there to turn it into, a, then we'd have to have, then we'd have bylaw being called every two hours to ask somebody to move their car because the bylaw says you need to move your car every two hours. The, um, uh, when it comes to the prime locations, the absolute, that's where I can actually get by uh, the idea of some fee. I just think 750 is too high. And I totally agree that just because someone has paid good money to have preferential access to something we are in control of, which of course is not private property, um, the, uh, doesn't mean they should have to stay there. I, I'd love to see them have that flexibility as well to be able to move around. But I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure we would be setting up a great system if there was a race to that location um, because there are a couple that are dramatically more uh, – uh, effective, you would think, and and that could create some unhealthy confrontation. So I, I'm that they're not agreeing with me on that one because I I never said that. Um, uh, if for me, it's more about just keeping the fees as as low as possible. Uh, and as far as the draw goes, it, it's only appropriate if we actually see competition, right? I mean, we're only last year we had two people apply, not at the same time, for two spots. It's only if we do see this industry grow that we actually would have to even consider a draw. And uh, and so uh, I guess, you know, as far as the bylaw goes, maybe we don't need to, to establish something that currently is not a problem that needs to be solved. Um, but I, I don't I don't know whether or not it needs to go policy or bylaw. If, it, if it's policy, then we can roll with it. If it's if it needs to be bylaw, then obviously it's more established. But I just I did need to make that point. I, I, I as much as I'd love to see this as lazy fair as possible, um, when it comes to how people behave when their livings are at stake, um, I, I'm not sure I'd love to see a demolition derby on the on the spray park with people trying to race there to the right spot because there's three of them now and two of them are gonna are gonna uh, fight to get there. What about um, maybe if you did a lotto, but they had it for a week, and that way, if no, if they nobody else come along, then they can stay there. If somebody else come along, they give them a chance. That way, you know, it's fair play for everyone because you want to see them all successful. That's just an option. Um, the hours, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm with Christine. Like the, you know. But I think there should be, like I said, Jay said, a variance. I think there should be. I mean, if you've got it there, you should be open for a certain amount of, because there has been times where vendors have their places and nobody, they're not open. So I think if you're going to be in some key spots, I think that's, I mean, you're not trying to tell them how to run their business, but, you know, I think their expectation should be at least two, three hours a day or something having the spot but that's just how I feel on that one um, one more to that point we could have different expectations for different locations 100%. There, there could be different expectations for the spray park location be, because it's absolute prime real estate we, yeah we and could, that's really yeah. all I'm thinking is down there because I mean at the beach it depends if there's a ball tournament and um, you know Wayne it depends if there's motorcycle rally like there's it all depends on what's going on so i i agree that people should be able to move is there any chance that um that alcohol on the, i've been asked this quite a bit <laughs> on down there or the plaza can they sell like what what would they have to do to sell beer or, or wine i mean there's been a Updates to the ALGC regulations for serving of liquor and alcohol. Typically, what's required is a, uh, a designated area uh, to contain it. However, some of those changes that were made uh, make it less restrictive in that way. 
Uh, so I can't say whether or not uh, ALGC would allow for liquor service uh, in relation to a, a vending unit of that type, uh, but they would have they would have to meet the provincial requirements. I think it's probably something worthwhile looking into because it's going to get asked, yeah. Anyways, so um, and then finally, is it possible that because this does affect people, and I agree with every one of you that I mean they do it because it's a start of business and they want to make ends meet. And can we have this, whatever final draft, not final, but the draft before we approve, can we, can we pull in a couple of vendors and like, is that, I know it's, I don't know if that's the norm, but. It's good public consultation. So that's an easy, easy discussion to have with the two vendors we had last year. So that's the, if they're both willing and able to do that. Yeah, I just think that there's no sense. I mean, I haven't ever ran one, so I don't know what the hoops and stuff they've had to go through. And, you know, maybe they can help us make it really easy so then we can have 20 of them flying around town. Then that would be awesome. And at the same time, we get our plaza filled, which generates all that business for our brick-and-mortar buildings. So, yes, Fred. I just had one point. We our brick and mortar people close down during the winter and go go south for the winter too. So, <laughs> Christine. So if currently we have three trucks right now, is there to get that first come first serve thing moving? Is there any way we can have three spots at each one? And then really, I guess when we start seeing people from out of town bringing their food trucks in, then we gotta obviously look at that, but can we set up three spots everywhere? Well, I think uh, what I put in front of you was geared towards getting people to get a seasonal uh, commitment in place. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. Number one would be so that we're not having to invest a lot of time and energy regulating someone who could sporadically be on site. Uh, that being said, if you do choose to put this into a bylaw and MPC is the decision-making body associated with it, uh, it'd be subject to whatever proposal they bring to MPC and, and MPC's decision and whatever conditions were put in place from MPC. Um, it does get trickier though when we talk about activity on weekends when we have limited patrol and, and that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, one of the reasons why it's geared towards being seasonal is just so that we don't have, you know, hundreds of different people. And that's why we try and direct those to the public markets so they have a place to land so they can do their thing uh, in a setting with other vendors at, at the same time. And it gives it better control. Market organizers are more likely to want to control and manage the success of their market that they run. Uh, so we would put a higher level of confidence in that than if we had to run around and chase vendors from one end of Drumheller to the other. I love the idea of combining the markets. I love it. Uniting. Uniting. So anybody else on that? Yeah, I like the, I like the option of getting some outside input because let's do it and do it well. But I'd, I'd definitely check on the alcohol. <laughs> Not that I... I just think it's going to be asked to be a lot. Oh, Christine? Sorry, I have one more. Um, is there anything that we're going to put in here that's going to be different for anybody that wants to come out from, let's say, Calgary or something like that with a truck for maybe a couple days? Because I know that I'm part of the task force that's on the art, arts and culture. And one thing that we've been talking about is to bring in cult, like different ethnic foods and stuff like that. And what a great way to do that would be like, oh, Friday night, this truck's coming in or something like that. Is there anything for that potential within here or is it just the same? I think if you worked with the market organizers, that would probably be a great way to involve uh, special events as part of that. Um, one thing I did miss in the discussion was... Uh, one of the things that we've always had was the ability for the town to say, it's Canada Day, sorry you're not going to be here because we have higher priority space and your vending unit may not be located at the same place than it 
might normally be because we're managing a market over here in the parking lot of the BCF where all the vendors go and then we would want to have the authority to direct them to that location, uh, which has been quite successful in the past that we've sort of clustered uh, vendors in a location closer to the BCF. So on that, if I could, Your Worship, the for me, Paul, it, it would boil down to the fee. If someone has paid a significant sum for their location, and we have then put on restrictions about when they must operate, um, to then say, and for the busiest day of the year, you must relocate, um, I would have a problem with that. If the fee remains incredibly nominal, um, uh, then I don't have an issue with us demanding that someone relocate for that day. Um, but the, yeah, that's, that's where I would slice that particular hair is, is how much are we charge? If it's, if, if the fee comes down to be hundreds and hundreds of dollars, um, I'm not sure I would f support asking that person to move on the best day of the year. Christine? Yeah, is there any way that, because I know that they, they go in and put them in front of the BCF then, is there any way we could say to those people that have paid all those those fees and stuff already, okay, you know this is coming down the pipe, you pick your spot. They're your first come, we take care of you first because you've already paid. Like, is there some way where we could be nice that way? Because they've already paid annually? Are you saying in, like, if we were organizing a market at the BCF? So for during Canada Day and stuff like that, if we say to the, the vendors that are down at the fountain, you can't be here, but since you've already paid to be there that day, we'll put you over here and you can you can yeah. have a spot. I mean, we could waive the fee for Canada Day and just relocate. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. And that would probably handle that issue yeah. and give them an option on that site where they want to be. I don't think that's a problem. Awesome. Fred? <clears throat> now throw a, a wrench into it. I, I I don't like the change that we made in moving the food vendors to the BCF and putting the beer gardens where all the families are. I, I haven't liked it since that happened. And I'd like to see appropriately beside the water park and beside the splash park that, that more family oriented things happen and that the that our priority isn't moving vendors that pay for that all year to some area out of the, you know, off the beaten track and we move beer in because that's somehow more important to us. That's just me. And I've been wanting to say that for a long time. And here I ask about alcohol. A good solution to that, Fred, is maybe right in front of campus Alberta and all that. There's nobody parked there all summer. You could do the whole beer gardens and foods all up this street and then you get all the people uptown so then you still then you don't have all the congestion in one spot and then you funnel it and now you've spread out the i think it's a heck of an idea <laughs> <laughs> well we just have to move them yeah but that's the thing now we get the people to stay downtown so we just have to change the route, just not to come down this street. Just go down the next street. Options. All right, anybody else? Okay, next. Paul, you're up again. 5.4.2, community assistance policy. Thank you for the feedback on mobile vending. I'll just start off by saying that appreciate it um yes and as we uh get into another inspired topic uh the community assistance policy i will grab my materials okay so, for some strange reason, I'm missing the first page of the RFP. Thanks. Thank you. 
All right. So council has uh, definitely discussed uh, a number of topics around community assistance. Uh, in the past, our uh, assistance of different community groups has been uh, fairly informal and uh, in many cases has been limited to uh, construction of playgrounds and other public works assistance projects. Uh, however, I've brought to you this evening a little bit of uh, information uh, based on the last feedback that you provided uh, when exceeding $5,000 worth of uh, request, uh, a request would go to council. And essentially what, what we're looking for is to identify uh, that process. And as well, uh, keep in mind the uh, attachments that I have, which just show the process that's followed for the Starland County Operational Grants, which uh, they do apply for each year. And you'll see Starland County's contributions on page 39 of the package, uh, operational grants to uh, the skating ranks of $95,000 respectively. And throughout, uh, throughout their region, they, they provide uh, direct grants. The idea here being, should council set aside a set amount per year as a budget item and then uh, allow for applications for community uh, project funding uh, as received uh, by applicants. Uh, one of the things I had in the, uh, in the package as well was to suggest that there be uh, one or two times a year, you would uh, consider applications that make logical sense, say in uh, March of each year and uh, during the fall, perhaps in late September, uh, when uh, community groups are looking at their budgets that they might want to consider uh, approaching council for funding rather than just having a kind of a wide open uh, and, and never ending stream of applications that come to you. Uh, the way, the reason for that being that we just organize applications and you'd have a stack that you could review, you could evaluate and then you could award them based on certain merit and criteria. Uh, rather than cap in hand, we would like you to give us X amount of dollars. And if council's uh, already dedicated funds, then you'd be in a position to say, uh, the, the funds for this year have been expended and you would refer them to the following year, uh, more than likely. Uh, of course, there would always be situations where exceptions could uh, exist. And uh, in, the, in those cases, council could entertain any request at any time. Uh, so it's not really uh, clamping down as, as much as it would be just saying that uh, here's a process that you can follow. And uh, these are some of the criteria that you would follow in getting uh, through that process and the council would set aside the funds in order to make sure that you're dedicating those to uh, certain types of community projects. There's also reference to what's done uh, in the case of the city of Red Deer uh, where they do a community recreation enhancement grant uh, and that includes uh, different building projects like play playgrounds but it also includes special events. There was some feedback from the County of Grand Prairie that I received, and it talked a little bit about how uh, it's a catch-all for the applications that, that were approaching other programs. And I think uh, in attaching that copy of Starling County's allotments for 2018, uh, I would say counties are in a unique pos position where they typically don't fund, directly fund recreation facilities. So, the way that they offer recreation is through other groups that run programs. And that's why you see uh, that level of support uh, in the case of Starland. In a similar way, that's common throughout the world of counties in Alberta. And uh, in a way, uh, is a bit of a baseline for the policies uh, that I had in front of you here. Uh, my contact from the County of Grand Prairie mentioned that the uh, it's a good that uh, they allow council to go through the process and when it's gone, it's gone. Uh, however, uh, 
the cons can be that uh, sometimes bigger asks can't be accommodated and they have to be reviewed outside of the scope of the requests that are made. Um, they do have a separate body that makes these requests, but in our case, I would suggest that that would be another layer of committees that we probably don't need at this time. Uh, council's fully capable of making those decisions and uh, can, could be approached uh, to fund whatever activities they see fit. Tom? Yeah, my, my only question would be, um, from my experience with some of these instances, uh, community requests, uh, that the, the requesting group or individual or organization or association or business or whatever, uh, they don't really have the expertise to know how much the request would cost. Um, they're, they're not in a position to estimate, you know, if it, uh, I'll give you a couple examples. So the demolition of the golf course clubhouse. So the golf course basically petitioned the town uh, to see if there was the, anything the town could do to demolish the clubhouse. Nobody I spoke to at the golf course had any clue about how much that might cost. Uh, so if, if they were going to do an application, say, the first thing that would have to happen is they would have to be in contact with the town and have somebody from the town basically come out and do an estimate and you know what I'm saying is that it, it could involve a little bit more uh, town time um, so I, I'm just wondering about that like, like you know I mean if, if you want to apply for you know a grant or something like that you, you have to know how much you're applying for and why and you know how much it's going to cost whatever you want to do and from my experience, most of the time, you know, these these individuals and organizations are just, you know, asking for some help, but they really don't know, you know, what might be involved and how much it might cost. And so, I don't know, just a comment. I can answer that. So, Tom, in um, the golf courses example, um, I remember quite clearly because they came before council asking for help. And I think we actually said that we would take it away. And I think it was myself and uh, maybe Al at the time still went out and actually looked at the site and gave an estimate and came back to council with a cost estimate. So I don't see that being any different other than you'd only see them once as opposed to twice because they ended up coming back to uh, make the request formally after we told them how much it was. Um, same thing happened with Green Tree School. We basically told them, you know, we took it offline after the request was made and went out and I gave a cost estimate and came back to council and reported it and that's what you approved. So what I, what I see with this, just maybe to kind of expand on, well, there's kind of two, two different pieces to this I see. So one is um, the, the ones that we, are, that we see generally more on an annual basis or more frequently than there's the ad hoc. So I, I consider Green Tree specifically an ad hoc or golf course an ad hoc. Um, tonight, Hope College, um, those are sort of annual asks. We've seen a number of those over the, over the last little while with respect to our budgeting process. I think the idea is to try to put it, put, put it all so that you can, as opposed to seeing five, six, nine, ten delegations over a couple of month period, you have a, it saves you time, saves all of us time by having them formalize what they're asking for. Uh, and then that comes before council as a number of paper applications that then you can make decisions on, on their merit, uh, as opposed to, and, and then if there are information that's needed out of that, then, you know, by all means, we call those folks before council for, uh, for discussion. But I think it's, it's to kind of help streamline that process a little bit. That, that's where I see that the ad hoc ones, um, they'll continue to be ad hoc. There'll be those requests that are just too good to uh, to pass up this year because there's a there's some grant money from someplace else where there's a need and they'll come to us as they come to us as they have come to us in the past. So. Jay, thank you, Your Worship. Um, 
I, I totally get what we're trying to do here, guys. I mean, the consistency uh, uh, in terms of how uh, funds are allocated. Uh, I think you phrased it very well, Paul, in the, that paragraph that says, well, grant programs require effort on for applicants. They also are a proven way to objectively evaluate and award public funds for projects that create the greatest community good. So I can I totally appreciate that. I think like any big culture change, though, that will take time. I mean, the, the getting the community to realize that they'll have to make those applications during a window will take time. Um, and so I think we have to be patient with, with how that might look. Um, and, you know, I, I also I have concerns around the threshold. I mentioned that before. And I, I do see the 5,000 fitting as it relates to, you know, the procurement procurement part. I, I, I get that. Um, although I, I do want to make sure that we still have the capacity to deal with an organization who asks for nine one thousand dollar things spread over a period of weeks or months, right? Um, that that's, that those have a tendency to have a real drain on capacity as well. Um, so just to clarify, is this a new fifty thousand dollars? Because if you're asking me to add a new fifty thousand dollars to this year's operating budget, no, boy, is your timing bad? No, the um, the idea is to kind of formalize the money. So we were already kind of spending it. Correct. Okay. So in that regard, then there's only, is this, are we trying to deal with those, you know, um, community association, uh, can you pave this spot along the exact same lines as a uh, Hope College ask for cash? Because the, the number of people who actually ask us for cash is quite small, where the number of people who ask us for in-kind support is huge. Um, and so... Uh, do we need to have the same process for for that captures all of them? Uh, but I think again that it, it's nice to have that the Hope College and some of those ones sort of go through that on an annual basis because they know what they're doing. Uh, the ad hoc ones, uh, as Paul mentioned, you know, sort of a couple of times a year or as the emergent situation may come up. I think again in most cases, most of the uh, Groups, I think we we don't give them enough credit. They they're planning for these ideas and they're looking for money all the time and funding and and so they have that ability to know before next week that they do need the money. So I would hope that we would be able to do this through a maybe it's a quarterly uptake or something along those lines. So we we'll, we allow a bit of flexibility to the applicants, but also recognize that it's uh, <clears throat> trying to get them more into the process of planning their funding applications with us because uh, I think as Paul pointed out at other levels, they're doing it already. Right? Yeah. So, you know, so it's just, it's kind of trying to align them up with us as well and, and trying to make all of us council aware of the, the asks, because again, as you say, when we ask for $9,000, $1,000 at a time, sometimes we tend to forget about the, the previous eight when we're approving the ninth. Yep. So yeah, guys, I, I don't, there's no part of this that's easy. This is not, I mean, the balancing off the small town we want to help with capacity and consistency. Whew. Uh, it's not surprising me that we're grinding over this stuff over and over again. I mean, um, because, you know, I, I would absolutely hate to have a, an October opportunity be turned down because we spent the 50K already. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, at, at the same time, uh, sometimes the answer for all kinds of things has to be ask us next year, but the, the, I'd hate to see us lose that flexibility, uh, to deal with, with something, uh, especially when they're first time things, you know, not everybody can plan their great idea to happen inside our window for funding. Right. Um, so, so long as we maintain that flexibility, not only that, but also I'd love to see us take a, uh, a more lenient view, especially if we're using the same pot of money for the in-kinds. Um, I, I know that when we charge things out, it's using approved, you know, somebody's figures for what it costs to have a grader being done by, by the hour. But that always assumes we're hiring somebody new uh, to do it, contract, rather than using one of our salaried staff. So I, I whenever, you know, 
the example I'll use every year is every every year when we hear what what it costs to do spring cleanup, it's always a, a gasp, and it's still the greatest one of the greatest things the community does. But when they cost it out on a retail basis, it's it's a you know it's a it, it's a twenty thousand dollar venture. No, it isn't. We didn't spend new money on that kind of stuff. We used salary employees on vehicles we own already, and so. I'd love to see us take a more realistic approach to the actual in-kind cost. You know, a yard of gravel is something that we know it's got a cost that we incur to, to get that. The guy to drive it out there works for us already in a vehicle we own. Um, I'm not sure we need to charge retail for that part of it, right? So that would be my only other feedback around that end. I, I get that. I understand that completely. I guess my <clears throat> maybe a contrary comment to that is that so when we do that yard, deliver that yard of gravel, with that salaried employee, sometimes we take that employee away from doing work that we then have to contract out. Um, case in point, tree trimming, right? So we, we contract out tree trimming because our staff are doing stuff that we're kind of helping out other parts of the community at. So there still is a cost sometimes. That we, so it's not always just salaried employees with our vehicle. Sometimes we are not doing things that we normally could do if we didn't they always accept jobs. So, damn it, Daryl, that was a great answer. <laughs> hey, Christine. Um, I'm just curious because I don't. Maybe I'm completely out to lunch, which is quite possible. Um, I don't think that. Well, speaking for myself, that personally I had a problem with the policy. It was the application that I think was the one that we were all like, soft kitty. <laughs> am I that? Am I wrong? <laughs> no, and I, I did take note of that and actually uh, working through that draft policy kind of sanded down some of the edges just to make it a little nicer so people don't feel like they're, you know, in a in a full Nelson or anything when they're having to fill out the form. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Well, I like. Have you guys? Did you read the what the um, Red Deer does? They do it April and October, as well as the Legacy Fund does it twice a year. It looks like. Oh yeah, four quarters. So those are options we suggest yeah, maybe quarterly for us as well for some reason okay any other questions on that all right guys oh lisa well on the red deer vein they also have an appeal form is that something you were going to be working on or maybe i just glossed over that i i missed that okay we don't turn anything down so there's nothing to appeal okay All right, is that it? This meeting is adjourned, 8.15. Thanks, guys. <laughs>